Well, we're going to take our Bibles, turn to uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3. If I could have your undivided attention for the next 35 minutes or so, well, then I will probably not keep you any longer. But if it's divided, then it may get into my time, and that would divide your time with my time, and that could add up to more time. So anyway, if, if you will just stand as we give reverence to the Word of God, we want to talk about uh, the rapture, the great escape. Uh, there are some that call us escapists, and I thought, well, I'm not going to take that as an insult. I'm going to take that as a blessing. It's like one time I was told, because I had put my faith in Christ to deliver me from all my addictions, that I was using Christ as... A crutch <laughs> and uh, my good associate uh, friend and uh, mentor even though I was his pastor he was sometimes my mentor brother Manini said that well pastor you shouldn't be offended at that why don't you just say he's more than your crutch he's your wheelchair <laughs> put your whole your whole life in his lap but uh, anyway <clears throat> We are promised by the word of the Lord that God is going to take us out, but he's not taking everyone out. There's going to be a segment of the church that's going to be left behind. And that segment of the church that's left behind is the church that, well, they have no idea that the Lord has left them. It's like the church of the Laodiceans. Uh, he's standing outside the door knocking, and they have no idea that he's outside the door. Uh, there's something wrong when we no longer <clears throat> are sensitive to whether God's presence is with us or not with us. Well, here we have in Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse number 7, a promise that God has given to the church of Philadelphia. We find that <clears throat> this is the church where there is no condemnation, only commendations. And he says in verse number 7, as he writes to the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, he says, Write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say that they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience." I will also, or I also, will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the, all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father, in the name of Jesus. Bless our time together. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, we understand that these seven letters to these seven churches throughout Asia Minor, and by the way, Asia Minor today is known as Turkey, and so that was part of the region for which these seven churches had been established throughout that part of the region of land known as uh, areas called uh, in uh, their day and time as uh, the areas of Macedonia. And we have the church of Laodicea. We have the church 
uh, of Ephesus, the church of Smyrna, and then we have the city called the city of Philadelphia, and there was a church there. And every one of these churches represent uh, our church age. They represent certain characteristics that we find throughout each one of the uh, periods of our church age. But more predominantly, uh, as uh, we get closer to the coming of the Lord. Uh, and we find that what is interesting here, the church of Philadelphia is the one that has kept the word. This is the church just before the church of the Laodiceans, which have pushed the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you don't push God outside. Uh, he just simply left. He's no longer in the church. He's outside of the church, and he's knocking, and he seeks to come in. I believe that's somewhat picturesque of uh, the day and time that we're living in right now. I believe that the church that has kept his word is in reference to this period known as the Reformation, where we have churches that uh, decided, no, we're going to stand upon the word of God. I believe this also pictures the period of King James in which the authorized 1611 of uh, the <clears throat> Bible was translated into English uh, called the King James Version that was translated uh, from uh, the uh, ancient manuscripts that they had at that time with the Old Testament Masoretic and the New Testament known as the Tectus Receptus. And they have kept the word, and many today have still kept the word, and others have departed from the word. But we still have a little strength remaining in us. Uh, there are some churches that still have strength, but th we find the strength is smaller, uh, somewhat less than what it was at the beginning. But nonetheless, the Lord has come. He has these commendations for us. Uh, he is telling us that there's an open door. And I have opened that door for you, and I will not shut that door. And then he also warns us, well, that door is open, so be careful. I come quickly. And when I come, he says, I have a reward for you. Uh, I'm going to bless you. You that are the overcomers. We talked last week about who the overcomers are as we went over at 1 John chapter 5 and found out the overcomers are those that put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So from this passage here, we can learn several truths concerning end-time prophecy as it relates to uh, the hour of tribulation that's coming upon the whole world to try the entire global planet and that the Lord is going to take us out from that hour. And he says, Behold, I come quickly. He says, I will I'm, I'm going to take you out. You're not going to have to go through this trial. I'm going to deliver you from this trial. Notice again, as we just look and notice what he says. He says, behold, <clears throat> in verse number 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation or the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them to dwell upon the earth. Now, we're not earth dwellers. We are citizens of heaven who are sojourning uh, in this earth with the earth dwellers. And God is going to take us out, but the earth dwellers, he's going to leave behind. And the Bible talks about those that dwell upon the earth we're going to go through great tribulation as we see in Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19. We who are not considered to be uh, citizens of this world, the earth dwellers, but our sojourners, we are going to be snatched out. We are going to be taken away. Now, can we trust God on this promise? Uh, yes, we can. God says we can trust him because of his character. Notice he says in chapter 3, verse number 7, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. The words of the Lord are true and faithful. God made that very clear when he said over there in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, everything that I've said about hell is true. Everything that I've said about the millennial reign uh, here on the earth, when I set up my kingdom, that's true. And the great white throne judgment, 
that's true. And my new heaven and my new earth that I'm going to bring down and that is prepared for you, the church, the bride of Christ. These are all true and faithful sayings. God makes it very clear that he would never lie to us. He makes it very clear that his word is faithful. His word is true, that his word is faithful and true because he's faithful and true. Uh, his morality and his righteousness is immutable. It doesn't change. And so when God makes a promise, he doesn't back down from that promise. And God can be trusted because of who he is. And so we can believe in the Lord. We can trust in the Lord because God is a God of his word. And we read all throughout the Bible where God had made promise and God made good on those promises. And so when we read of 80% of what God has made good on, we can be assured that the rest of it he will make good on. And there is much that is going to come, and God is already, he's already preparing us, and he's already warning us, and we can see what's coming because it's already out there. And God makes it very clear that what is coming is his kingdom. The entire, the entire program for mankind is God's kingdom here on earth. God has one thing in mind uh, that he wants to do before he sets up his eternal kingdom where <clears throat> mortal man will cease to exist. There will come a time in eternity where flesh and blood will no longer exist. For flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither the corruption inherit incorruption. So there's coming a time where mortal man will no longer exist. We'll be in glorified bodies, in spiritual bodies, and we will live all, throughout all of eternity in those glorified bodies. There'll never again be any such thing as corruptible flesh. But <clears throat> God has made a promise that before he sets up his eternal kingdom, that he himself is going to reign among mortal men. That when Jesus Christ comes and sets up his kingdom here on earth, uh, he is going to reign among uh, both those that are spiritual, those that are immortal, those who are angels, and those that are mortal. And there is going to be, as we understand from what we read in the Bible, there are going to be those during the millennial reign, as beautiful and as wonderful as it will be, there will be those that will die at an early age of 100 years old because they were rebellious against God. There will be those <clears throat> that will not be able to say the devil made me do it because the devil himself will be bound hand and foot and cast into a bottomless pit and remain chained up there for a thousand years. And so at the end of that thousand years, guess what? He's turned loose for a little season and a big part of the millennial kingdom for which Jesus Christ is reign over, has reigned over, will turn against him and will set out to war and battle and destroy his kingdom and the people of God. And that's when the Lord says, all right, that's the end of mankind. Mortal man will cease to exist. This planet as we know of it will be completely burned up and destroyed. And God will set up his eternal kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness forever and ever. But God makes it very clear that this is something that he says must happen. God himself is going to come down and he's going to reign among rebellious mortal men. And he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, you don't have to rule with a rod of iron if you, don't, if you have people that are compliant and obedient. But when Jesus Christ comes, he's going to have to rule with a rod of iron. And he's going to bring them into submission. And those that refuse to come into submission, he will deal with them and he'll deal with them swiftly. And yet, we understand that even with all those problems that man will seek to bring, it'll be a glorious kingdom. It'll be a wonderful kingdom. Uh, man will live for a thousand years, and things will be reestablished to what it once was there in the Garden of Eden. But sin will still remain in the earth. 
And there will be a reminder of their sins. So during the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the temple will be established. And uh, there will be offerings that will be offered up reminding them of what Christ has done in the past for our sins. And keeping them focused on the need for trusting in a Savior. So sacrifices will be provided. There will be a high priest and those animals will be killed and their blood will be shed. All of this is going on during the millennial period. We read much about it over in the book of Ezekiel beginning with chapter 40 through chapter 48. And so it's a very complex system and it's ruled by the Lord. And guess what? You and I who are going to be raptured out are going to be clothed in royal robes of righteousness, studded with beautiful crowns, and we are going to serve him over these kingdoms as priests and kings. And not only will we be judging this world, we'll also be judging angels as well. And so all of these things are things that must come to pass. We read in Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 7 again, he that had the key of David. What does he mean, he that had the key of David? Well, he's talking about the one that has the key to the kingdom. The Lord has the key to the kingdom. Based on what we read over in Isaiah 22, verse number 22 and 23, which is in parallel to what Jesus is saying here in Revelation chapter 3, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulders, so he shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. So here we find what is being said over in Isaiah 22 that is almost verse by verse verbatim to what we just got through reading in Revelation chapter 3. God has opened the door. What does that mean? To the church, he's opening the door to the kingdom. You and I are going to be, have a part in this kingdom. And so he's opening the door. We get this idea that this open door is in reference to this life. No, the open door to the church is in reference to the door in heaven where we are going to be prepared as we read in Revelation 4 and 5 to where we're going to come before the Lord at a place called the Bema Seat and we're going to be judged on the way we lived our lives as we talked about in the Sunday school hour. And based on how we've lived our lives and labored for the Lord in our bodies, whether it be good or bad, is going to determine on how much authority and power we are going to be given to reign with him over the key, over the kingdom for which he has the key of David too. Amen. All of this is going to take place and it's going to take place very soon. So we read something else in verses 8 and 10 of Revelation chapter 3, that God's kingdom here on earth is our blessed hope. It begins with the church going through that open door, escaping the wrath that God is going to pour out upon this planet, their hour of tribulation, which is in reference to Daniel's 70th week, to where we will be snatched away into heaven. Again, let me remind you what he says in verse number 8 and verse number 10. He says in Revelation 3, verse number 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now notice verse number 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. The word try is in reference to tribulation. The tribulation is coming upon the earth. And the open door is in reference to the open door to the kingdom of God for which the Lord Jesus Christ has the key of David that brings about the millennial reign or the thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ here upon the earth. 
Now, it's important for us to notice in Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 1 that this begins at the end of the messages of the churches. We come to the church of the Laodiceans where the church is neither hot nor cold. God would have them that be either hot or cold. And because uh, they have pushed the Lord Jesus Christ outside the door, he's still giving them an opportunity. Get things right because I'm coming soon. And we read in Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 1, he comes and the church is taken out. John is a picture of us in heaven. We read in Revelation 4 and verse number 1, after this, after what? After the seven messages to the seven churches. What do they picture? They picture the church age. The end of the church age comes something glorious. The church being taken out of the world. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither. This parallels with what we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 13. I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again, even so also them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are remained, which remain and are alive unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord. And we will forever be with the Lord. So this is a coming that is not mentioned by the general consensus, uh, consensus of uh, the coming of the Lord. This is a mystery. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Uh, this does not involve his advent where he comes to earth to set up his kingdom. This involves something that is secret where the church is taken out, the world is left behind and ready and prepared to go through what is known as seven years of great tribulation for which the Lord made promise to us because we have kept the faith, because we have been faithful, he will keep us from the hour of that tribulation. We will be taken out. Now, <clears throat> it's important that we understand that we have a responsibility to live our lives actively for the Lord. That we're not to be caught up in this crowd that would snatch our faith away or keep us from coming to that faith. You know, there's so little being said about the coming of the Lord anymore. It's a very important part of God's doctrine. The full gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the death, burial, resurrection, and the coming of the Lord. We find that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And there we are told that Christ died, that he was buried, and he rose again. But we are also told in that same chapter that he's coming again. And we're told that we need to be ready. We need to be preparing that every one of us uh, can, through our faithfulness to God, can change the outcome of what glory that we'll have when we get to heaven. Some, because of their lack of faithfulness, will have less glory than those who are much more faithful. And so God has made promise to us that every one of us... Uh, are going to be taken out if we put our faith in him. But the devil's doing everything he can to rob the church of that faith, to bring them under the guise of everything but the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of them are going to be left behind, not because uh, that they were saved and were unfaithful in walking for the Lord, but because they were in church, they were singing, they were serving, they were somehow thinking that they were saved, but they were not saved. They were not fully trusting in the Lord. So Jesus says, you need to pray and make sure that you're not being 
beguiled by Satan and by these false prophets that are out there tickling your ears and that you don't, you, you don't have this intensity to be drawn into having your ears tickled, but you should have a desire to hear the truth regardless of how much it might burn your ears. We're, we're living in a day and time where they would rather have their ears tickled than they hear the truth. I don't want to go to the doctor and have him lie to me. I want to hear the truth, and I want to hear what needs to be done to take care of the problem. So we read here in Luke's gospel, chapter 21. You may want to take your Bibles and look there, beginning with verse number 34. Luke's gospel, 21, and verse number 34. Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with Surfety. Now that's in reference to excessive, ungodly, and moral living. He says, and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as since for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So he says, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to what class? Escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. Now, <clears throat> there are those out there that say, well, you people that believe in the rapture, you're nothing more than escapist. You're teaching that you... Think that you can be worthy to escape what others weren't able to escape. The tens of thousands of, of Christians down through the church age that were horribly, horribly tortured and persecuted for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That you think that you're worthy, that you're better than they, and that you should escape that kind of judgment. What kind of people are you? And so they label us as escape us. And they, they said, well, you know, God's wrath has been poured out upon uh, generations. What makes you think that you are worthy to escape that wrath? Well, we're not talking about the wrath of God down through the church age. We're talking about the wrath of Satan. Jesus Christ made it very clear that they're the ones that's going to hate us. They're the ones that are going to persecute us. They're the ones that's going to kill us and put us to death. Well, that would be the same. Uh, they're the ones that are going to do everything they can to make your lives miserable. Why do they hate us? Why do they set out to persecute us? Because they hated me first. And because you love me, then they hate you because of me. And so that's why they're persecuted. Now, during the tribulation period, it's no longer Satan's wrath, but it's God's wrath. And God's wrath is not upon the church. God's wrath is upon the dwellers of this earth. Our wrath was taken care of on the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ took our place, and by faith we believe he took our place. And so the Bible says that we have been delivered from the wrath of God. We're told over in, the, in the, where is it, um, no, somewhere, we're told somewhere in the Bible <laughs> That God has not appointed us, uh, oh, Ephesians, there we go. We're told in Ephesians chapter 6, I believe it is, that God has not appointed us unto wrath, but unto salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are, nah, that's not Ephesians, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 9. Um, finally, the old brain started working like I like the old concordance. I used to used to work like the Young's concordance, but I'm no longer young, so. I, but I still have the old strong in me, so I got the strong concordance working there. But yes, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 9, God has not appointed us unto wrath, but unto salvation. And so we are instructed not to sleep as the matter of some sleep. But we're to be alert and we're to be awake because we know that the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon this old world. And yes, there are times where some of us would love for the Lord to come, 
Oh, Lord, would you just please come? Oh, it would be wonderful to come today and I'd be delivered from all this old godly, ungodly problems in this old ungodly world. Uh, but sometimes we fail to realize that when, when the Lord does come and take us out, then God's wrath is going to be poured out in all of his fury and all of its indignation upon our loved ones and family and friends and neighbors who are not saved. And so we should be laboring and working, knowing that we have just, just a little bit of time We're doing the best we can to snatch them from the fire indignation that's going to come upon them. So we're not escaping, uh, as some would have us to think, the wrath of God, but we're escaping the wrath of Satan, and the Lord is taking us out so that we don't come under the wrath of God for which the Lord is going to pour out upon all the dwellers of this old world. And so we're not appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation, because Christ has already paid the price. So we are to live our lives worthy of this great escape, in confidence of knowing that we are escaping, and we're going to be taken out because of what he has done for us, realizing and understanding that he has paid the price, and that we have the faith in believing as we look to this old world and we look to all the temporal things that these things are not worthy to be compared to the things that God has prepared for us that love him. So we don't look to the world, we don't look to the flesh, but we look unto the author and finisher of our faith. We're told over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 8 that we are confident and I say... And willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done whether it be good or bad. Now, what he says in verse number 11 ought to be an eye-opener for every one of us. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 11, he says, Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience, meaning that by the word of God, through the apostle Paul, through the apostle Peter, and by the things that they have written in warning us and assuring us that one day the Lord is coming and when he comes he's going to require of us faithfulness and readiness that it's going to be a fearful thing to stand before him unclothed in righteousness, to stand before him in rebellion, to stand before him with an attitude that has been resisted in the Holy Spirit all throughout our Christian walk with the Lord. In fact, Jesus gives this parabolic message over in Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, beginning with verse number 44 through 51. He says, Therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And then he gets into this parabolic message. Now, if this is a parable that illustrates the truth. He says, Who then is faithful and wise servant? whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth in his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and to drink with the drunken, the Lord of the servants shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware, and shall cut him asunder and appoint his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this is not talking about him going to hell. He's talking about great sorrow and great regret when you are given your portion with those that are nothing more than hypocrites, 
They're actors. They never really put their heart into it. They were never sincere. They had some underlying hidden motive for what they were doing. But it wasn't for the Lord. One day he is coming and there is going to be what is known as the Bema Seat. We see that in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And the crowns that we will be given, we will cast before him at his feet. The word of God is very clear where he talks about where you and I are building upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Either wood and hay and stubble or gold and silver and precious stones. And one day it's all going to be judged by the fire of God. And yet some will be saved, but nothing more than by the fire of God. And they'll stand before God with nothing in their life to show for the Lord. They've wasted their time. They've wasted their moments. They've wasted their life in nothing but frivolous living, living for the excessiveness of the flesh and the world and for the lust of the eye and the pride of life, nothing for the Lord. Their whole life has just been wasted in carnality. And they're going to stand before the Lord and they're going to be ashamed, the Bible says. In fact, I want you to notice something in Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 11. This is important that you see this. Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 11, he says, Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now, what's interesting about this word quickly is the Greek word that it's translated from. The Greek word that it's translated from, if you don't believe me, you can look it up for yourself. It comes from the Greek word tachos. Tachos is where we get the word tachometer. It's where we measure uh, revolutions per minute or RPMs. It's in reference to when you rev up the engine. When you rev it up, you're revving up the RPMs. You're getting ready to do something. You're getting ready to do something quickly. You've got the clutch uh, fully disengaged. You've got it down there in low gear, and you're revving it up to 700 RPMs, and you're ready to pop that clutch. You've got pause of traction rear end. I mean, you've got a full-blown Hemi with, with, a, with racer cam in that thing, and you're going to smoke those tires. You're going to move down the road, and you're going to move down there quickly. Well, the Lord makes it very clear that at his coming, he's going to start revving things up. It's not going to be slow. The signs of his coming are going to be revved up to the point to where it's going to move very quickly. You're going to see things happening just like this, quickly, quickly, quickly. There's going to be a pandemic. There's going to be rioting. There's going to be depression. There's going to be suicides. There's going to be nations rising up against nations. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be hurricanes. Everything coming all at us at one time. All God's word that talks about these prophetic signs that deal with the tribulation period upon our heels are all going to be revved up. Just like someone racing that motor, getting ready to race out into the track. back as we were. I believe he revved it up to a place to where we're at that place of no return. Yeah. Easy for the Lord. This sudden destruction. The Bible says when you rev things up then everything is going to start happening quickly. I want you to notice he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse number 1 through 3 but of the times and seasons brethren you have no need that I write on you for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction. Sudden. It doesn't happen slowly. It comes quickly. It comes without warning. I remember when my mother gave birth to my, my brother uh, Michael. That was the last one she gave birth to, number, number 14. And I was at that time a, a 
teenager and I had my own car. I had this 59 Plymouth and I had uh, big old 12 inch slicks on it. I had positive traction rear end in it. I had a Hurst uh, four speed transmission on there with the Hurst shifter. And boy, that thing would fly. And I'm, and I'm like, she said, oh, Jimmy, go get your car. I got to get to the hospital. And I revved that thing up. I had a little tachometer on there. And I got my mother in there. And I was flying 90 miles an hour down Tomlinson Avenue to get to the hospital. We got her there. My brother Alpha went running into the emergency room. They came out there with the gurney. And Mike was born on that gurney. Got her there just in time. So she wasn't born in the back seat of my Plymouth. I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to happen suddenly. I mean, the birth pains aren't going to be, well, you know, they're three minutes apart. And uh, they, in the next three or four hours, they're going to be uh, two minutes apart. No, it's going to happen suddenly. If the birth pains are going to come quickly. And, it's, and there's going to be no time to prepare. The Bible says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Things happen rapidly. We read in Revelation chapter uh, 22 and verse number 7. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. We read in Revelation 2 and verse number 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. You see, if we're going to do anything for the Lord, we better do it now, and we better do it quick, because he's coming, and he's coming without warning, the Bible says. And we will find ourselves in the twinkling of an eye, standing before the Lord. And the things that we have built in this life, the Bible makes it very clear, uh, we will have to give an account for. We read over in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians that when we appear before the Lord, it's called the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to have to give an account for what we've done in our bodies, whether it be good or bad. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 11 through verse number 14, for other foundations can no man lay than that which is laid in Christ Jesus. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. That day will come quickly. That day will come suddenly. There will be no more opportunities, no more time to prepare. Whatever you've done for the Lord, it's over. The whistle has blown. You've been raptured into the presence of God. The time card has already been clocked in. And your day is finished. And you're going to stand before God. And you're going to give account for those hours and those days that you've lived for Him. So we must be constantly watching and preparing as the Lord opens that door. We read this sad story over in the book of Matthew chapter 25 concerning a part of what I believe to be the church that was not ready. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. You see the parallel here? Now we know that it's not talking about Christ's millennial kingdom here on earth. It's got to be talking about the rapture because he comes quickly here. He comes, he says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Well, <clears throat> we know when he's coming based upon Revelation chapter uh, pardon me, in Daniel chapter 12, when the abomination of desolation takes place, God gives to us the number of days that uh, we need to prepare for his coming. When he comes to set up his kingdom, he even tells Daniel at what lot, on what day he will be raised up. But we don't know anything about the hour nor the day or anything about the time that the Lord comes to snatch his church out. And so we have these five virgins that were unprepared. 
And suddenly the Lord comes and they realize it's too late. The door has been shut. The door is no longer open. We read in verse number 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him into the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You know not, watch therefore, for you know whether you know not whether the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. So he says, Watch. Are we watching? Are we prepared? Oh, we smirk, we laugh, we mock about it. All oh, that's, that's, they preach that too often around here, Bible Baptist. They need to preach something else. No, God wants us to get ready. We're not hearing it anywhere else. Very few places are talking about it anymore. And if there's ever a time for us to get ready, it's now. You say, well, I don't believe that applies to the church. Well, then you haven't read over there where God makes it very clear that he has, has espoused himself unto his bride, the church. And that one day we're going to stand before the Lord. And he has a beautiful gift for us, for his bride. The new Jerusalem coming down prepared for his bride. There's a marriage supper. And we're going to be there. And we're all going to go into that place. And the door is going to be open. Are you sure that you're going to go through that open door? Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there truly the oil of the baptism of the Holy Spirit dwelling within your soul? Then let me just say in closing here, we will receive more than a crown in heaven. We read in Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 12, 13, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. This speaks of the security that God has promised to the true believer. And he shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What has God promised us? He's promised us a threefold assurance of our salvation. I will write upon him the name of my God. That means ownership. Remember Woody in that cartoon fictional? And uh, Woody, he belonged to somebody because Andy had his name written on Woody's foot. And so Woody knew who he belonged to. Well, God has his name written upon you. You are property of God. You belong to him. And he has placed ownership on you. You are no longer your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are his. The name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. This shows that I am not a citizen of this world, but I'm a citizen of heaven. My citizenship is there. I'm not to live for this old world where I'm nothing more than a sojourner and a stranger. But I live for heaven because that's my citizenship. That's my home. And one day I'm going home. And then we find thirdly, I will write upon him my new name. This is the Lord Jesus Christ assuring us that we are included in the heirship of whatever belongs to him now he shares with us. This is co-heirship. We have an inheritance undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved for you who have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. A great wealth and great, pos and great uh, uh, prosperity that God has given to all of those that have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, you'll wear much more than a crown. You're going to live in a city that is the city built by your God. You're going to have his name written upon you. You belong to him, and he's going to share all that he has with you. Oh, friend, don't miss out. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure that you have received the Holy Spirit. The Bible makes it very clear that he that hath not the Spirit of God 
is not the Son of God. We must understand that the only way that we can be assured that the Spirit of God living in our lives is when we open our hearts and invite the Lord Jesus Christ into our lives. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. How can we be assured that Jesus Christ knows us? Well, we can be assured of that when we have his spirit living within us. Because his spirit will bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Does God's spirit bear witness with your spirit? If God's spirit bears witness with your spirit, then God's going to either give you an attaboy or he's going to convict you. The spirit of God is going to convince you and convict you to serve the Lord. He's going to convict you about believer's baptism. He's going to convict you about church attendance. He's going to convict you about reading your Bible and spending time in prayer. He's going to convince you of the truths of God's word by sharing with you and illuminating your mind in these truths and teaching you as the great master teacher. Do you have the Holy Spirit of God working in you doing those things? Or when he comes, are you going to find yourself without the anointing of God, without the oil of God, and the doors shut? And you find yourself here upon the earth with no opportunity to enter into the kingdom of God. How tragic will that be? Jesus will say, and we're told, let me close with this, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, Jesus made it very clear. Many will stand before me in that day and say, Well, Father, I've cast out devils in your name, and I've done many wonderful works in your name. And Jesus will say unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. And he will have them bound hand and foot, and a strong angel will cast them into the lake of fire, where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth forever and ever and where the flame of the fire of hell is never quenched. Oh, my friend, don't in no way turn your back on him. Make sure that your heart has fully open, has been fully open to the Lord Jesus Christ. So many times our hearts can deceive us. We think, well, you know, I, I, I think I'm okay because after all, I sing in the choir. I think I'm okay because after all, I go to church regularly. I think I'm okay because after all, I do try to read my Bible once in a while. No, does God have residence in your life? Does he live there? Have you put your faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you understand that the only way that you can get to heaven is by believing he died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again and invite him into your heart to be your savior. Heavenly Father.